Joseph Vidito had had enough. A notorious gang of escapees from the Jackson prison had been stealing the Spring Arbor farmer's livestock and harassing his community for two years. Assuming they'd eventually be back for more, Vidito took up a nightly vigil, sitting on his farmhouse porch with a gun in each hand. Then one night, in 1842, they returned, and Vidito saw his chance. He grabbed his gun and fired. Alas, the farmer missed his mark. Angry at the interruption, the gang quickly overpowered and beat him, eventually leaving Vidito for dead. What the gang didn't anticipate was neighbors coming to Vidito's aid that night, resulting in a shootout between hardened criminals and farmers that finally brought the Jackson robber gang to its end. But why did it take a gang of farmers to wrangle a horde of escaped prisoners back to prison? This is Michigan Crime Stories. Michigan Crime Stories is a podcast that explores murder, mysteries, and mayhem in the Mitten State. Criminal behavior has always enthralled us. It's when societies determine what is and isn't allowed. We assume heinous crimes are committed by monsters, individuals we dehumanize in an effort to make sense of their deeds. Their victims sometimes seem distant, just faded names in a passing headline. But the terrifying truth is that crimes are committed by ordinary people just like you and me. And many of those crimes happen right in our own backyard. My name is Darcy Moran. And this is John Counts. We're reporters for MLive.com and your hosts for Michigan Crime Stories. This episode, told by resident history buff and MLive political reporter Lauren Gibbons, is titled The Jackson Robber Gang. In 1838, the newly minted state of Michigan needed a secure place to house its most notorious criminals. Authorities thought they'd found the perfect location in Jackson, then a marshy swampland full of speculators eager to capitalize on the business perks of penitentiaries. But the first incarnation of the Jackson prison, or the Michigan State Prison, as it was then called, was nothing like the brick-and-mortar prisons of today. It was a wooden fort built with large tamarack trees, bordered on the west by the Grand River and otherwise surrounded by a large oak forest. A mix of the prison's ever-growing inmate population and hired hands were called upon to help build the fortress, but the towering walls of tamarack logs were porous. Some reports estimate seven of the first 35 prisoners escaped into the trees, undetected in earlier prison breaks. A few years later, the prison population had grown to 85, most of whom were in custody for larceny or burglary. One of those prisoners was George Norton, who at 22 years old was already sentenced to life for thievery and was suspected of murder. Norton was the brainchild of the escape plan and gang, forming a brigade of fellow burglars and telling them how and when they should strike. He was apparently a good organizer because all but two of them made it out without a hitch. On the hot, foggy night of June 1, 1840, 12 men saw their chance to escape and took it. When an entry gate opened to allow a police wagon to enter on that foggy June night, the men made their move. Some snuck through the gate, others escaped through holes under the fort's wooden walls, or vaulted over them. Two men were captured, but the ten who didn't get caught swam through the Grand River and escaped undetected into the adjacent forest. To learn more about what the escapees did with their newfound freedom, we spoke with Judy Gale Krasnow, an expert on Jackson prison history and author of Jacktown, History and Hard Times at Michigan's First State Prison. Krasnow said the gang's main focus was on livestock. They would often steal cattle and horses from farmers throughout the Jackson and Spring Arbor area. As a gang together, they managed to arm themselves and they were all fairly good uh, I guess you call them sharpshooters. Um, and they did things like there were stagecoaches going through. They robbed stagecoaches. They were, by the way, pre-Jesse James. 
I mean, this was before the Jesse James gang, but they were very much like that. And they would do things, for example, women would be walking by with what they then called perambulators, great big carriages, and uh, were in town or about to do a robbery. They had mastered the art of making the sound of rattlesnakes. And there was a particular uh, breed of a snake with a rattle in Michigan. And uh, so they would rattle like that and scare these women who would go running and oftentimes drop their purses. The Jackson robber gang was even more empowered by being the only game in town. With no rival gangs to fight or fend off, the escaped convicts could focus their entire attention on stealing money and livestock while terrorizing the community, and few were brave enough to even think about challenging them. It's unclear exactly how many people were killed by the gang, but disappearances in the Oak Forest were common during the gang's heyday, and those who lived and worked in the area were terrified that they could be next. At least 12 people are estimated to have met their end at the gang's hands. It was about two years after their escape that Vidito took up his nightly post and eventually came head to head with the Jackson robber gang. Unfortunately, his grand plan didn't work out. Vidito shot at the gang members, missed, and was savagely beaten and left for dead. But the night's events weren't over yet. The, all this commotion was heard through the air by the next door farmer, a man named Doris Spencer, who rounded up a posse and uh, killed George Norton, shot another in the leg. Two of them escaped and were never found. The seven gang members who were left in the commotion were outnumbered and surrendered to the farmers who summoned police to arrest the convicts. Despite his injuries, Vidito survived his ill-fated run-in with the robber gang, Krasnow said. The men who were captured were returned to prison, where their actions resulted in poorer conditions for both themselves and the other inmates. Prior to the gang's tenure, conditions at Michigan's first state prison were relatively mild. There were no cells, the prisoners slept dormitory style, and were mostly given free reign within the fort's walls. The robber gang's escape and subsequent criminal activity over a two-year period forced authorities to rethink their game plan. It was the Jackson robber gang and their two years of rampage that made the state and Jackson say, if we are going to have Michigan's first state prison, we had better build a brick and mortar and sandstone edifice with walls around it and have a genuine penitentiary. Prisoners were quickly put to work to build a brick and mortar prison to prevent another Jackson robber gang. The first cells were no larger than five and a half by four and a half feet, and the sanitary conditions were less than ideal. Each prisoner had a bucket for restroom needs, and those buckets were only cleaned once every 24 hours. They were also often subject to strict no-talking rules and frequent physical punishments, including whippings and hanging by their arms for hours at a time. Prisoners in isolation were placed in dark cells, where they were fed only bread and water. By 1934, the Jackson prison held more than 5,000 inmates and was the largest walled institution in the world. So what happened to the robber gang? When those who were captured returned to the fort, they were likely whipped and chained in a solitary area where they couldn't escape, Krasnow said. Their prison sentences were extended to reflect their escape and their crimes, and they spent the rest of their lives in the new facility their crimes helped inspire. Okay, well, I'm Darcy Moran with Michigan Crime Stories, and I'm sitting here with Lauren Gibbons, who told this story today, and uh, fellow co-host John Counts. Lauren, thank you for telling this story. Um, I have to say one thing that's really struck me in all of this is the fact that it took farmers to bring the prison gang back in. What were police doing at the time? What were the efforts to get them back under prison control? 
So that's an interesting point, Darcy, and I think it's important to note that actually at this point, Michigan was almost a brand new state and the prison was brand new. Uh, Michigan was founded in 1837 and the prisoners initially escaped in 1840. So it was a new system. I've had it described to me by historians as a wild west of sorts out there. Um, So there wasn't a ton of support for um, for folks to, you know, have have these convicted criminals um, caught and brought back to justice. So uh, in the end, it did take a group of farmers who were kind of sick of the situation uh, to finally, you know, finally get the get the courage to go up against these hardened criminals. So do you know a little bit about what the justice system was like that back then? It seems like there's a little... Um there was kind of this official system starting out and this sort of uh, vigilante type system. Was it more vigilante before the prison was founded? Um, before the prison was founded, yeah, it was a little, it was at that point, you know, almost a territory. Lawmakers, uh, when the state started, uh, wanted to get the, get the prison up and running. It was one of the first things the legislature did. And um, it was interesting because a lot of cities actually competed for the honor of having the state prison because it actually was a boon for local businesses. It put Jackson on the map in terms of having, uh, uh, it it was actually at that point, um, a lot of uh, hard labor uh, for prisoners. So the prisoners were used as labor. A lot of the local businesses benefited from that. And so uh, Jackson was very thrilled to have the prisoners at first, but you know, that didn't quite correlate in terms of having uh, having the infrastructure in place to house these prisoners. They were in a wooden fort for, uh, you know, several years before we got the brick and mortar thing in place here. So switching gears slightly, I'm curious about this information that these prisoners actually killed maybe even 12 people. You and the same brain John, wave. John is shaking his head because he wanted to ask that question. But um, I, I'm curious um, about the fact that these uh, gang members killed about 12 people, and if there was reasoning or what their motives were when they were primarily, you know, uh, scaring women and doing robberies, uh, livestock. So these folks were pretty focused on the monetary aspect of being a gang. They were focused on getting livestock and robbing uh, stagecoaches, robbing uh, the richer women, as you alluded to. Um, So actually, a lot of the uh, murders and disappearances were part of this robbery. Uh, Judy Gail Krasnow, who has done extensive research into this, said at the time it was very difficult to determine whether somebody had been murdered by the Jackson Robber Gang or if they had just disappeared in the forest, uh, but pretty much everything was in the area. Um, it, it, it unexplained disappearances or you know people going missing in the forest, a lot of that was blamed on the Jackson robber gang because it was kind of assumed that that was what was happening. And what do we know about George Norton's background? So George Norton was a young man, he was 22, and he was actually uh, put into the state prison for Uh, larceny charges, various larceny charges. He was not convicted, but was suspected of murdering someone during one of those robberies. Uh, So he had a pretty large rap sheet before the Jackson robber gang was even founded. But uh, when he was in prison, uh, he was he got the gang together. He was kind of the organizer of the plan and uh, was hoping uh, basically just waiting for the right opportunity that foggy night when the um, when the group could get away without detection. And so that's interesting um, that you note that he was suspected of murder as it relates to a robbery. It seems like there's precedent for those those deaths that are attributed to the gang that it could have been part of that robbery. He was known to to do that before. Yeah, these folks were all pretty experienced criminals. Most of them did uh, did have robbery charges or larceny or 
uh, burglary or various charges related to that nature. But yes, there was a precedent there and uh, the crimes did seem to escalate as they got more power. Uh, I was told that it was uh, it was similar and actually predated sort of the Jesse James gang. Um, you know, similar tactics were used in terms of scaring people and occasionally resorting to that violent uh, murder um, if somebody was putting up a fight. Okay, well, I think we will end it there. Thank you so much, Lauren. I am Darcy Moran. And this is John Counts. And we are Michigan Crime Stories. Many thanks to Judy Gail Krasnow, author of the book Jacktown, History and Hard Times at Michigan's First State Prison, and founder of Jackson Historic Prison Tours, for the interview and expertise. Thanks also to Steve Rudolph of Jackson Historic Prison Tours for assisting with some historical background of the Jackson prison's earliest inmates. Additional thanks to Experience Jackson and the Cell Block 7 Prison Museum for online resources. You can pick up a copy of Krasnow's book on Amazon, on the Arcadia Publishing website, or at several Jackson area locations, including the Jackson Historic Prison Tour Shop and Sam's Club. Thank you for listening. Michigan Crime Stories is about telling the hidden, unknown, important, or odd stories in the state of Michigan. If you know a story that might fit the ticket or something you'd like to know more about, you can email me at dmoran at mlive.com. That's D-M-O-R-A-N at mlive.com. I'm Darcy Moran, and this is Michigan Crime Stories.